first of all, you can absolutely do it. On this episode, I'm painting old crappy furniture and make it look brand new. But let me tell you guys, this is the most enjoyable and therapeutic process in the world. All my stress that I had before is gone. And it's so much fun, especially when you're doing this with your kids or friends or family. And I'm gonna show you everything you need to know in details so you can achieve great results with your refinishing project. Okay, I have a ton of different old dinosaurs here. I have tables, dressers, nightlight stands, dining table, chairs. So buckle up, let's get into the process. There's a lot to cover. If you guys see me using some fancy equipment, don't panic, don't stress, there's a ton of alternatives. Way more affordable, you can rent some stuff. I mean, you can rent pretty much everything except for consumable. And uh, if you're still not sure what to use or whatever, you have some questions, drop them all down below. I'll be sure to answer all of them. Okay, first is obviously taking all of the metal parts like candles, screws and brackets, everything off. And I also take off all of the removable parts. So I can spray everything separately, preferably flat. So we have less issues and we get a really, really nice smooth finish. Because it's way easier to spray, you know, things flat. Since we're in the shop, we can certainly do whatever we want to make our life easier. So I took off all of the doors here, as you can see, these are off. I took the drawers out. I took this one out too. That door is off. And also I took off all the hardware because it's way easier to take it off rather than masking everything and then, you know, having those lines that are not painted properly. So everything is off as much as possible. And now this, you know, bare bone cabinet can be sprayed easily without any risk of overspray, you know, runs or anything like that. I mean, there's always risk, but we really try to minimize that risk as much as possible. And now when we got everything ready, the very first step is cleaning. This is not a kitchen refinishing project, so we don't have a ton of fat, grease and oils on the surface, but we do have some wax on the drawers and some fat around the handles, and we absolutely need to get rid of it. I usually quickly go over everything with my mix of acetone and naphtha, and once again, it's a mix of 70% naphtha and 30% of acetone and we use some scotch pads to rub it on and get rid of all the stuff that we have and then wipe everything right off right away before it dries with anything paper towels shop towels whatever you have on hand guys when you use acetone make sure you wear a mask please safety is very important okie doke all right i'm gone always always we send everything because we need that mechanical bond and the reason for that is when the surface is absolutely smooth then our new coating the our isolating coating will not bond to the existing surface you know good enough when the new layer of paint it dries completely there's a good chance that it will peel off you know as one continuous film but if we have a really really rough surface if we zoom in really really close then we're going to see the surface like, you know, kind of rough and our coating will bond to it mechanically. Next up is our isolating coat. What this is and why do we need it? First, we don't know what we have on the surface. Whatever lacquer, varnish or anything that they could have put on the surface before, we just don't know what it is. And we don't know whether it's going to show through the finish. We don't want to deal with any of that. So we need to encapsulate everything. And also we need the adhesion. And the stuff that works the best with it is isolating coatings. Here's my guy. I already took all of the doors off. It's got some damages all around, you know, all of these scuffs and marks and some big, big, big dents as you can see right there. And since we're painting everything with the solid color paint, two component polyurethane, we can fill all of these dents with filler either a two-component Bondo or a spot putty or red glazing putty as we always use. It's a single component stuff. And then we're going to be ready for our Isolante coat, which is an isolating coating. And this is an industrial isolator. It's a two-component product and it can only be sprayed in controlled environment when we have our air exhaust and everything, so in the shop. If you guys do it yourself, you can only use a single component isolante, but also if you don't have access or you don't really want to look for that good stuff, you can get the uh, Zinser 
bin shellac based primer from any of your you know big box retailer store that stuff will also encapsulate anything that you guys have on the existing surface not as good as our two component isolante or a single component isolante but it will do a relatively good job so now i have everything sealed with my two component isolante as you guys can see this nice glossy finish means that everything that we had uh, on the surface got encapsulated so basically like we trap anything that we could have bleeding through the finish now everything is sealed and it's not going to escape it's not going to show through the finish now we're completely safe and it's already dry i'm gonna go ahead and sand everything yes next stage sanding everything really really good thoroughly but not like too hard too aggressive we're gonna go with the fine sanding pads and the sanding discs 320 grit for the discs and the very fine or fine for our sanding pads for the smooth for the soft ones and we're gonna go ahead and send everything and get ready for our undercoat or prime coat on this project i have a lot of spray work to do and while i'm spraying i'll quickly talk about different methods of application what sprayers do i use and when and what's the right material what's the right situation for each and every type of sprayer the short answer is the viscosity the viscosity meaning if it's very very thin if it's very very low viscosity we want to use a lot of air in order to atomize it and get a very nice and thin film so our material doesn't run even though some of the materials have a really really good vertical hang this is a rule of thumb the thinner your material is the more likely it is to run on the other hand we have heavy body materials that are very high viscosity very thick those ones we would want to run through airless sprayers or air assisted airless with that type of sprayer we get that hydraulic pressure that helps us atomize the material nicer and at the same time we get the efficiency sometimes when i feel confident that my coating is not going to run even though it's kind of thin for example polyurethanes even solvent based polyurethanes i still run them through my airless machine and here's why when i spray it flat there is a very very low chance that something's going to run unless i have some sort of weird profile where i can have those you know sags but even then i can do a couple of light passes and i still get the nice hang but as a general rule the thinner your materials are the more air we need so regular cup gun wouldn't work with any heavy body material and the other way around i wouldn't want to use an airless sprayer with very very thin and low viscosity coatings on this project i'm running both airless and my regular air fed hvlp which is a cup gun all right now it's time for the top coat and here's what i'm using for my top coat i'm using two component polyurethane even though i feel like it's a little bit of an overkill in this situation just because we don't really need that much of a chemical resistance on these units except for the dining table that is a completely different story but in general all of these standalone items they don't really need to be chemical resistant i mean who's gonna make a big mess on the nightlight stand i mean you know do you really need to clean it with acetone probably not so one component waterborne polyurethane would work just as fine i'm not a big fan of any acrylic paint i mean regular sandy gloss or satin paints that are designed for walls I'm not a big fan of those at all when it comes to painted furniture, but if you're a professional finisher, then man, I definitely recommend adding that second component, the hardener, which is isocyanates. That second component makes it super hard, makes it very, very scratch resistant and also chemical resistant. But with that, you would need to use air fed respirator and a very good ventilated area because when you spray it, this stuff is not good for you. Uh, when it cures, when it dries, it is the best. I mean there's no off gassing whatsoever but while you're spraying you definitely need to use proper ppe okay as i mentioned before tabletop is a completely different story by the way i have a really really nice video on the full stripper finishing on tabletop i'll link it somewhere around this video but here's what i'm doing on this one after i apply my color my base color which is black on this one i put a protective film over top just to get extra durability when we scratch that clear coat we're not gonna get any 
dents or scratches going into the paint. So our color is not going to change. And that's why I'm going an extra mile and adding that extra layer of protection. And here's what I'm using. I'm using a two component acrylic polyurethane, which is very hard and clear, UV resistant, super scratch resistant as well, chemical resistant. So it's like the best. But again, if you're a do yourselfer and you're spraying your dining table yourself, my best advice would be to get that table or the tabletop itself and go to your local spray shop and get them to use some really, really good stuff. This is the part where I would get some professional help because there is no single component stuff that I know of that will beat the two component. Both two component polyurethane and acrylic polyurethanes are really, really good for your tabletop. Now, when we got everything delivered back to the client's house, here's how it looks. <laughs>